Great. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Good to see you. Good to see you all in class. Uh, once again, what's up, Francis? <laughs> uh, good to see you all. Uh, everybody online. Chira, missing you here, man. What's up? What happened? Uh, sir, my health is not too good, so I joined this here through online. Also. Okay, okay, cool. All right, well, you take care, man. Hope to see you soon. Hi, Nina. Good to see you. And everybody else, good to see you all. Yeah, Thanks for joining in. I see Ravali is joining online. OK. Sorry, cool. Uh, well, welcome to this course, uh, the local church. Uh, we will be using a APC publication called The House of God. Uh, Chira is like uh, the ghost suddenly. <laughs> Yeah, I hope you all got the publication, APC publication, The House of God. We will be using that. And I hope everybody online was able to download um, the PDF that I was shared in the stream section. Um, if you haven't been able to download it, uh, please let me know. I'll uh, I'll share the file again. OK, uh, let's pray and we, before we get started. Father, we, we thank you for this uh, new day. We thank you for this opportunity that we have the privilege that we have, Lord, to learn from your word. Lord, I pray that we will never take this opportunity, this privilege that we have for granted to learn from your word. Um, so Holy Spirit, right now, uh, we open up our hearts, Lord. We open up our hearts to you so that you would open up our eyes to the wonder of who you are. And so Holy Spirit, I pray that you will come uh, and, and just reveal the wonder-working power of Jesus. Uh, I pray that you would reveal and pour out uh, and touch us with your wisdom, with your knowledge and your understanding. As the word says, you are our teacher, our counselor. I pray that uh, we would be sensitive to the leading of your voice. I submit and surrender uh, everything, every word that I have to share. Uh, speak to me, speak through me, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Uh, okay, so we learn a little bit about the local church um, this semester and this subject, about the importance of it, uh, what is God's plan for the local church? Uh, why is it important? What happens if it is not important? Uh, and whose idea it is, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so in a way, um, we are all kind of part of a local church, isn't it? Wherever you come from, uh, you know, maybe in the city uh, for now, some of you help in APC uh, and whatnot. But we are kind of, part of a local church isn't it um and um and there's so just in this locality or the locality that i i come from uh it's called uh, horamau agra and so yeah horamau agra yeah babu sapal yeah so from kamanahali around kamanahali to my area locality of where i come from itself has approximately at least 3,000 churches. Yeah, I'm not kidding. OK, yeah, so we did the survey long back when we did this power to change campaign um, mid 2015 or 16 or something. Now it might have increased. But just to say that, OK, yeah, there are a lot, lot of churches. And uh, for many, that can be the local church for that area for you know that they attend to, that they are a member of. Uh, and even if there are 10 churches, all if all 10 churches will have different methods in the way they function, isn't it? Like they won't be identical. And that's why some of us are part of a certain church because we like certain methods and the things that happens in a church and uh, whatever, right? It's, it comes down to a personal preference, isn't it? Um, but when we talk about the church or the global church, uh, have, has anybody asked you this question? Uh, hey, uh, are you a Protestant? Yeah, They've been asked this. So I, I kind of get a little confused when someone asks me that question. <laughs> I'm like, uh, are you a Protestant? I'm like, I'm not really protesting anything right now. Something happened like 500 years ago. Uh, <laughs> uh, are you a Catholic? A Catholic simply means global church. So I'm part of a global church in a sense. So that means, yeah, OK, I'm a Catholic. So you know, uh, that's what Catholic means. 
when it comes down to the doctrine, that's when Roman Catholics comes into a difference. That's the difference between Roman Catholic and Catholic. Catholic simply means global church or the universal church. So in a sense, we are all part of a universal church, isn't it? And um, and so <laughs> there's, you know, we've we've made this thing of church, you know, so, so vast and so it can be very confusing, isn't it? But God has given us a blueprint in his word, isn't it? And he has always done that. Uh, we look at a verse very soon, but then he, Jesus said in, the, in verse, uh, he says, I will build my church, isn't it? We look at that verse in just a second, but I will build my church, okay? Uh, now, anytime God tells someone to build something, he just doesn't say, go build. Yes or no? Noah, go build an ark, Noah. However you want it, whichever color you want, paint, bindas. In a whatever shape you want, go build. No. He gives the dimensions, right? Uh, the meters, uh, every inch matters, isn't it? So what he's giving is in his own way, he's giving Noah a blueprint. Yeah? And the same thing with the tabernacle of Moses, isn't it? So he tells Moses, okay, now he goes into the details of interiors and all, interior designing and all of that, right? Of which color, how it should look, what skin you're supposed to be using, all of that. And then Moses comes down with the blueprint and he gives it to the people of Israel saying, okay, here's the blueprint. Now let's go build it. Then he goes and finds the craftsmen, the skilled men, you know, people who are skilled, who, are, who can build and design all of these things. So um, let me just share. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen... Um, an image of a blueprint. If not, I'll try and share it so we can all just kind of look at it. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Does anybody's house look like that? Okay. Okay. Can you see the screen? Okay. So floor plan. <laughs> right. So that's an example uh, of a blueprint. Okay, an architect would uh, explain this way better. Uh, but um, I have a couple of friends, uh, so I asked them because you know we use the word blueprint a lot in this uh, publication, at least in the initial stages. Um, so my friend said that before they start a day constructing, right? Okay, they come in and they start. Okay, we're going to build. They look at the blueprint. At the beginning of the day, before their hands touch any tools, uh, you know, uh, a hammer, whatever, they look at the blueprint and they'll plan. And after they finish the entire day's work, they'll come again and look at the blueprint at the end of the day, after they finish their work. So they look at the blueprint before they start the work. And after they've done for that day's work, they'll come back and look at the blueprint and just to see if everything is all right, if everything is according to the blueprint that was mentioned, right? The measurements and all of that is in place. And so um, God's word is filled with, you know, uh, reference points for us. And so this manual, the house of God, is, uh, is just going to help us enhance and look at what you know the bible has to say god's word has to say as a blueprint um, are you guys with me yeah so we're not going to look at the exact methods i'm you know this course is not about okay if you follow these 10 methods you will have a successful church uh, it's not about that we're not going to give any methods or specific techniques to run a local church but we're going to constantly look at god's word as a blueprint and what he has said about how a local church should function Okay, so what Jesus has said, uh, how a local church should function. And so that's what we will be looking at. Um, uh, everybody okay? Yeah. So I'll stop sharing this. Um, yeah, everybody online doing all right? Just let me know. Um, as most of us are here online. <laughs> okay. Um, let's continue. We'll go to the chapter one. Um, but okay, before we go to the chapter one, if you can we just quickly go to the table of contents. Uh, in the publication. We'll uh, just have a quick glance at it.
Awesome. Okay, so we have a few sections. Section one will focus on its origins and its purpose. Uh, what is the or you know where does this idea of a church originate from? What is its purpose? And under that, we have a few topics that we will look at, um, and we will look in depth, in detail about what uh, you know the God's blueprint, God's word has to say about the local church. Um, and section three talks about divine order and section four talks about ministry organization and development. OK, and um, and section five talks about reaching out. So we have five different sections uh, towards the very end. We will not be we will not be covering all the chapters and I'll uh, tell you why. But let's go to section one, chapter one to start things off. Section one, origins and purpose. So uh, the main, what is, uh, what do you understand by the word origin? Where it started. Where it started? Yeah. Beginning? Yeah. Origin. That's what the word origin is, isn't it? Um, we've seen that title in so many movies also, like the origins of Superman, origins of Spider-Man, you know, that means it's the beginning story, isn't it? Um, and so when we look at, the section one and chapter one, uh, chapter one titled The Church, it's spiritual and natural dimensions. So just by the title name, we can understand or we need to understand that the church has a spiritual dimension to, dimension to it and a natural dimension to it. OK, so there are two different aspects to the local church. OK, um, so let's start off. Let's look at the verse uh, chapter Math, uh, Matthew, chapter 16, verse 15 to 19. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15 to 19. Let's look at that. And I want you to pay very close attention to it because I want you to tell me later what you understand uh, of it, okay? Matthew 16, 15 and 19. Uh, he, that is Jesus, said to them, but who do you say that I am? Question mark. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, comma, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay, cool. So very quickly, uh, just share a few things what you can take off or you understood from that. Anything? Jesus, like he's asking like his disciples, like um, who does who do they think that he is? Because he's been with them like yeah. for these many um, years or months, and um, like Peter is the only one um, who uh, truly saw who Jesus was. Right. That's why he said uh, that you are Christ the Messiah and all that, yeah. and um, and then um, Jesus. Um, and I mean, Jesus blesses Simon, and he tells him that, um, um, like, no one has told you this, or uh, it's not by your own thinking. It's right. God who has uh, told you this or revealed right. it to you. And uh, he also says that Peter, uh, that he's going to be the one who's going to start the church. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um. So uh, does. If you have your Bibles, does any uh, does any of your Bibles say where this thing happens? Matthew chapter sixteen. Um, oh, thank you. Okay, In, yeah, Caesarea Philippi. Philippi, Philippi, it's a pronoun, so it doesn't really matter. Tomato, tomato, potato, potato, whatever. So, <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so now, uh, see, here's the thing about 
uh, so there's a difference between reading the I've mentioned this so many times, right? Reading the Bible and studying the Bible, isn't it? Um, Bible was written for us. That means when you read the Word of God, you are blessed, you are edified, you are encouraged, you are uh, everything, right? You are empowered, isn't it? The Bible was written for us, but the Bible was not written to us. Okay, it was written to a different audience, a different people, thousands of years ago, right? Um, so as, that's why, I, you know, when we meet someone for the first time, we ask, okay, hey, what's your name? Uh, where are you from? Someone says from Hyderabad, immediately what do we say? It's like, oh, I love Hyderabad biryani. You see, we, as soon as they say where they are from geographically, we associate the culture of that land, and then we can go on, isn't it? Yes or no? Okay, so now let me just quickly show us the map of where this place is. Now, you can see that? Awesome. Okay. So that is the map of the ancient Israel and whatnot. You can see the region of Nazareth and Galilee and all other names that is mentioned there. Okay. Um, you see the Sea of Galilee and then the Dead Sea up in the north, uh, you know, and then you see right on top with the, where the Aramark points it says Caesarea Philippi. Okay. And it's actually in the place where it says Banias, B A N I A S. Okay. It's up in the north. Now, Caesarea Philippi, now that during this time, King Herod was the king, King Herod. Okay. It's the son of. The other king Herod, uh, he had three other, three sons. Okay, so each of them had he built a temple for them. He had given them in charge of three different regions. All three is not mentioned, but it's there. One of the sons' name was Philippi, and so he uh, this son Philippi was in charge of that region, and uh, Caesarea was given to in honor of Caesar. Okay, like because Roman emperor. Uh, Roman, Roman what? Empire. Roman Empire was still in charge of that region, isn't it? Um, so that's where Caesarea Philippi is. And then if you just look above, is slightly in the top right hand corner, it says Mount Hermon. I know most of the scholars uh, claim that's where, if you follow, um, that's where they are going next. If you read in the next chapter, is that's where the Mount of Transfiguration kind of happens okay and now that mount hermon is in israel is the highest peak in the region of its entire nation of israel that mountain is about uh, 9000 odd feet or something and so as you keep climbing up that hill um, the weather changes and it, it's filled with snow capped so if you later google or youtube mount hermon there are a lot of ski resorts Ski. Where do you have ski resorts? When there is snow, isn't it? So that region is filled with snow. Now, every time there's a snow, when the climate changes, there will be the snow will melt down. And then just like the Himalayas, you know, water, there will be abundance of fresh water, right? Filled with rich. And when, wherever there is abundance of water, the land is fertile. Okay. So there's a lot of things happening here in the region for, for, for us to understand that. Um, so that is where they are at. Secondly, that region was strictly prohibited for the Jews. Why? Okay, so now take a quick glance at it. If you want to take a photocopy of it, you can take uh, as in sound photocopy screenshot. Uh, let's I'll stop sharing. But now I'll show you. Let me share another. I'll give so many. Now I'll show you. Uh, I, I'll I'll share that image. Okay. Now, can you all see that uh, region, that image, the screen? Yes. No. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. So now that is um, the region, a part of the region of Caesarea Philippi. Now, this place was prohibited for the Jews to go there. Why? Because 
think of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the evil they did and multiplied by a hundred. Multiplied by a hundred. So this place made Sodom and Gomorrah look like a holy people. The kind of evil that happened in this place. Like you can think of everything nasty from idol worship was the basic thing. <laughs> from idol worship to sexual immorality to bestiality and 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 uh, children sacrifice. You know, all of that, uh, everything that God absolutely hates would happen in this place. Now, now you can imagine when Jesus is taking all these disciples to the region where this, it's prohibited for the Jews to go, everybody's wondering, oh, where are you taking us? Why are we here? We're not supposed to be here. You know that, right? I hope you know that, Jesus. We're not supposed to be here. Now, the place is called Banias because that uh, it was a Greek and a Roman god called Banias later, which called was renamed as Pan. That's why it says the grotto of Pan there in the image. Okay, now, now you see like a cave over there with water, abundance of water. Um, okay, so here's the thing. I said that um, the land would be fertile and and everything nasty that would happen in their place, isn't it? So what people of that region would do is they would offer up a lot of sacrifices. For example. Um, Okay, we'll just. So what the people would they would do is let's say for example they would take a lamb, okay, uh, and and you know cut it, kill it, and then they'll throw it into the cave of which is filled with water there that you see. Now if the lamb drowns, that means their offering is accepted. So that they will have a bountiful, fertile a harvest. If the lamb floats, uh, that means the sacrifice is not accepted. Okay, all these cultural things I'm just sharing with you because it's pretty nasty, isn't it? And there will be a lot of idols of all these. Uh, and Pan is one of those gods. If you look for those Google images, uh, you'll be half man, like with the body of a man and with the head of a goat. That's I'm not making it up. Okay, it's yeah. <laughs> okay. Don't look at me like <laughs> okay. Um, and then uh, there will be a lot of graven uh, images of all these idols over there. And another idol that will be present over there, uh, I mean, that they carved was a Greek god by the name of Echo. So this, according to their uh, mystical whatever thing uh, understanding, this particular god always used to live in caves. And so now you understand the phenomenon that happens in a cave when you say when an echo thing happens, now you know where the word echo comes from. Because of this, God used to live in one cave, that's their understanding, you know. So all these different graven images of uh, you know Greek and Roman thing would be present in that. And now the disciples are seeing all of this. The disciples are seeing all these graven images, idolatry, and all the evil that has happened. And then Jesus turns to them. Who do you say I am? You see, the weight of the question is he's not just asking. He's making everybody see what you're, you know, what is happening there. The most evil place there. And then what follows also is, this is brilliant. Now, there's something called biblical allusions. Um, allusions is, Jesus used that all the time, is if he quoted a verse, he was not from the Old Testament, he was not just pointing them at that particular verse. He's always pointing at the verse before and the verse after. And that's why most of the time they wanted to stone Jesus. <laughs> uh, as in, he also made them think. Right? And so uh, that's why it's kind of important of what happens before this verse, where it's happening, and what's happening after this chapter. You know, what's, what's going on. So, okay. You want to take a screenshot of this? Oh, because it's available on Google. But uh... okay, yeah, that's also available on Google. Okay, so I'll just stop sharing the screen for now. Um, and so now we look at that verse again. Uh, let's go to the scriptures, Matthew sixteen fifty nineteen. Then it says to them, He said to them, "But who do you say I am?" In the in the midst of everything that you see, of all these man-made gods and idols and whatnot, okay? And then, um, 
Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's a very powerful declaration, isn't it? Uh, now, uh, despite the fact that everything that is going on, um, then, then Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you, uh, say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, uh, oh man, I wanted to make one other point. Gates of Hades. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. Where is that? Yeah. Um, just one, one more time. Just a very quick glance, I, because I missed out at a very important point. Uh, I mentioned about that cave, right? That water. That was supposed. That was known as the gate into the underworld. That was known as the gate into the underworld, according to the people of that region. Gate. And so now you also understand why Jesus is using the word gates. You see these gods, you see these gates of hell and all this evil thing that's happening, you know, people throwing sacrifices there, child sacrifices used to happen and all of that. You see that evil thing, the, the, the gates of hell that's being worshipped as, uh, that was not going to be successful. Okay, as you advance. So, and I say to you, uh, I will build my church and the gates of Hades, like in a way he's pointing it, you know, metaphorically uh, and literally, he say, shall not prevail against it. So the church that I'm going to build and the culture that I want to establish and the kingdom that I want to establish, see on this earth, will you know will succeed and the gates of hell will not prevail against it right and i will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven okay uh, are you all with me so far yeah 30 minutes has gone by so fast okay so uh, a very uh, and on this rock another important point that we need to remember is on this rock what is the rock uh, most of them say it's okay it's peter and all of that but when you study the text and its consistency with every other scripture you see what jesus is pointing out and saying this revelation that you had that is the rock the revelation what that i am the son of the living god i'm the christ the anointed one on that revelation on the revelation that jesus christ is the son of the living god the anointed one on that revelation I will build my church. Okay. So then Jesus says that, goes on to say that, I will build my church. That means the church is his idea. Right? Anytime you come and say that, okay, I want to build this, I say, like, hey, let's build a computer, uh, let's build a new instrument or whatever. It's, it's obvious that it's your idea, isn't it? Like in Bangalore, Bangalore is another thing is known for is what? Startups, okay. Everybody wants. <laughs> it's like, hey, let's start the startup. It's supposed to be funny, but okay. <laughs> let's start a startup because everybody has an idea. And so here Jesus is saying, "I will build my church," and that means it's clearly that is his idea, okay. And denominations are man-made. Um, and so one of my friends is studying. Um, He's studying a lot of things, but you know everything related to theology. <laughs> uh, but then it's it was very astonishing. He said there are at least at least forty thousand denominations. Oh sure. Uh, what I can think of is say okay, Methodists, Lutherans, Pentecostals, Marthoma Catholics, Syrian Marthomas, uh, Syrian Orthodox, what else? Baptists, brethren, so I, I can't, I can hardly touch ten. Okay, but uh, but the study that he was doing, uh, he was suggesting that you know, in every region, every country, again, you know, you go to Russia, they have they have their own bunch of denominations and whatnot, right? So uh, all the denominations are man-made, but the church, the global church, uh, you know, the origin of it is God's idea. It's His idea when He says that I will build my church. Okay. Um, and so another truth that statement can claim is that when Jesus says, I will build my church, that means the church is his. The global church is his. No man can claim that church is my idea. 
I made it. Let's spread it. Okay. See, I guess all of this is fundamental truth for us to understand the importance and the significance of the church globally and then locally. Right? Uh, you're with me, right? Okay. So, uh, any questions so far? Any thoughts that you want to share? Ask. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Yeah. So he's talking to Peter, but then in, he's addressing everybody. Everybody understands that, right? Okay. Um, so is all okay? Okay. So followed by when Jesus says, I will build my church. The following statements, uh, he says, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Okay, so another thing that he's implying there is historically, uh, ancient cities had gates. Okay, and it's like at the gates, uh, you know, we have panchayat systems here where the panchayat leaders will sit under the tree, banyan tree, and, you know, talk about the welfare of the city or the town or the village and whatnot, right? So all of that used to happen at the gates of the city. Everything important, everything political uh, to discuss about the welfare of the town or the city or the village used to happen at the gate. Okay, so that's uh, and and so if you can break through the gate, that means you have access to their political system, to the welfare, and, and now you have control because you've just gone through the gate, isn't it? Are you with me? Gates are important, isn't it? It's like, uh, spiritually speaking, uh, for example, like the altar used to be, uh, is, a, is a gate into the kingdom of heaven. Like it's, it's a bridge where heaven meets earth. Like altar is a gate. So I will enter his gates, his gates with thanksgiving, right? So that means you're entering into the realm uh, of something supernatural, something beyond, something powerful, okay? So God is saying that one of the only function of the gate is it can open and close. Yes or no? That's the only thing that can happen. Can the gate move front and back? It really can't, right? It is stationary. Yes or no? So when Jesus is saying that the gates of hell shall not prevail, that means what he is saying is that he is saying the church, you advance. Because the gate is stationary, it can't move front and back. You advance to the gate. You take the fight to the gate. And when you take the fight to the gate, don't worry, it will not prevail against it. That means you will come victorious. Are you guys with me? Yeah? Are you all okay, no? Okay, so the gates do not come to us. Sorry? <laughs> oh, yeah, this is pretty deep, yeah. That, that, that entire that, that portion of scripture is pretty deep, yeah. So we advance to the gates. The gates do not come to us. Okay, uh, we can't say as a church, okay, I'm comfortable. Now I'm a Christian. I will go every Sunday. I will sing a few songs, come back, chill on a Sunday afternoon, and I'm happy with that life and whatnot. But as a church, collectively, individually, this is the truth. God has told us to advance, take the fight to the, king, uh, to the kingdom of darkness. And the kingdom of darkness will not prevail because I am going to win and I have won. Yes? Right. And because I have won, the next statement follows now in present tense is that I have the keys. Right? What was lost in the Garden of Eden? Like this is a very famous saying. What was lost in the Garden of Eden? Jesus won it in the Garden of Gethsemane. Right? When he said, "Not my will, but yours, be done." Yeah. Um, and so that's how he won uh, against the enemy, and then. In Revelation 1.18, the your notes will say, um, he says that all authority has been given unto me. So the keys represent authority in a way, isn't it? Like, uh, I mean, anything light, um, basic, you can think of a security 
God also. If you come, no matter how early you come, the dude will come in like a boss. It's like, I have the keys, <laughs> right? So that kind of represents uh, authority, and that's what Jesus has given to us. It's like, okay, what I have won is not just for me. What I did is for you. And I'm giving this to you, right? I'm giving you the key so that now the authority that I have, you have. Okay? Uh, and, and that verse, uh, Matthew 16, towards the end, it concludes by saying, um, whatever, so it says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And you notice the language there is, I will give you the keys. Jesus is not saying, I have given you the keys. No, Jesus is saying, I will give you the keys. That means he's prophesying in a way saying that I'm going to rise from the dead. I'm, I'm going to die on the cross. But I'm going to I'm going to come up victorious with the keys. That's when I will be giving you the keys, right? isn't it? And that's when you see Matthew chapter 28. All authority in heaven has been heaven and earth and has been given unto me. Therefore, go. That means I'm sending you with authority, isn't it? And then he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in uh, in heaven. Okay, so the right interpretation of that is uh, whatever is loosed in heaven, we have the authority to release it in on earth, and whatever is bound in heaven, we have the authority to bind it on earth. Okay, so if sickness and disease and all of that is bound in heaven, the authority has been given to us to release it in this realm. I bind the sickness, I bind this disease, right, in the name of Jesus. Are you all following? And what has been loosed in heaven? Uh, all the joy, peace that passes, all understanding, etc., uh, etc. Et and all of that, healing and deliverance, uh, the keys of that has been given to us so that now we have the authority to release it on earth, isn't it? And so um, that is, it's almost apol ap apol uh, what is that? Uh, apostolic in nature, that prayer, the, all those scriptures uh, that we say. Is everybody okay? Are you all doing all right online? Yeah, okay. Francis? Okay. Okay. Actually, thought I'd go a little fast, but then I'm still stuck on page one. All cool, right? Okay, cool. All right, let's move on then, guys. Um, and so the meaning of the word church, uh, so we understood the origins of it. Um, we, you know, the idea behind it is it is God's idea. It is a God's um, will and, and, and whatnot. It belongs to him. And so the word church comes from the Greek word, as it says, uh, ekklesia. Um, what do you say it in Hindi? Kalisa. Alicia, so you see the connection. You see, it's very similar, isn't it? So, yeah. So, ecclesia. It's a Greek word. It simply means uh, ek means out of. Um, klesis means a calling, to call. Uh, so, when you put it together, that means you've been called out of. It's interesting, isn't it? The church. Yeah, it's been you've been called out. Okay, you were in darkness. Okay, you're called out of. Okay, it's like the people of Israel coming, been taken out of Egypt. So you've been called out. You've been redeemed. Okay, so the church is redeemed, and that kind of points to the salvation that we have in Jesus, isn't it? Um, so we've been called out. Uh, we are in this world, but not of this world. We've been called out. We've, we've been, in other words, it simply means set apart, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, right. So let's look at a few points there mentioned. So this was used among the Greeks for a body of citizens, for a body of citizens gathered to discuss the affairs of the state. So a bunch of people were gathered together to discuss the affairs of the state. And so they were known as Ecclesia. Um, and there's so much to take off from that. Uh, as citizen, as heavenly citizens, that's what the Bible calls us, isn't it? As heavenly citizens, we are to gather and discuss about the affairs of the kingdom of God so that it can be established here on earth. 
uh, as a gathering of Israel summoned for a definite purpose. In its literal sense, the word church simply refers to the gathering together of those who have been called out. In its simply simple reference terms, that it simply means that it's a bunch of people coming together who've been called out. Right? Um, so, and there's just so much depth uh, to that kind of understanding is what is okay to a normal person is not okay to a church. Right? Um, so, for example, like uh, Nazarites from the Bible, Nazarites for Numbers chapter 6, it talks about the Nazarite vow and whatnot, right? Um, and the Nazarite vow for a period, a person when they say, okay, I'm going to make this vow for a month or two months for that period, you're not supposed to drink wine or cut hair or go and close to a, you know, to a dead body and touch it uh, and all of that, right? So basically in that sense, the Nazarite vow is uh, what is known as a holy vow. And so what was okay for a normal uh, Jew, a Hebrew, was not okay for a Nazarite. What was okay, you know, if it was okay for a person, I mean, it was absolutely necessary to help a person who is dead, to help in burial and whatnot. Yes, isn't it? Um, so what was okay for a normal person was not okay for a Nazarite. Wine represented legal pleasure of those days. Drinking wine was a legal pleasure. Like in this day, it's like saying eating chocolate. So that's why they had wine and weddings and whatnot. Okay, so it was a legal pleasure. That means nobody would say like, "Why are you drinking wine?" It's illegal. No, it was a legal pleasure. And so, what was okay for a normal person was not okay for the Nazarite. It's the same thing with the church. Is what is okay for the world? What is chalta hai for the world is not okay. It's not chalta hai, right? <laughs> Sorry, a little bit of Hindi came here and there, but uh, <laughs> okay. So, uh, it, yeah, I mean, all of that is is very significant. Um, the church is, we all know this church is more than a building. And I think we all felt the importance of a church during the lockdown, right? Some of us met after like nine months, it's like, oh. Oh, bro, hi fi, everybody's hi fiing for the first time. It's like, I haven't seen you such a long time. It's been like forever and all of that. All the worship recordings used to happen in that hall. And then, you know, and then we would uh, live stream it. Uh, and we would need once in two months or something just to record. Like for five Sundays, we'll record in that, you know, that hall there. And uh, so I think we kind of felt the importance of the community, of us coming together, the people of God. Who are called by his name, meeting to you know in his name. Uh, you know, that's the significance of it. And and the beauty of is like, you know, you and I, we make a church, isn't it? And when we say that the church is his idea and the church belongs to him, we belong to him. Right? And we are all gathered. Like I know this, you know, this is Bible college, and all of us have a background, all of us are from a place of our own, but we are all coming together. And one name, Jesus. And we have that one purpose. We want to go back and establish the kingdom of God, wherever we come from. And that's why you and I are here, isn't it? And that's the beauty and the power of this idea of the church, which belongs to God. Um, yeah, I think, we should I continue? Okay, let's just make, let's make one point and... Uh, Okay, so in this chapter one, it's titled as the spiritual and the natural dimension, isn't it? So one of the points of this, we look at the spiritual dimensions and then later we look at the natural dimension and we'll see how far we can go. Okay, uh, the, one of the spiritual dimension of the church is the, the word of God says. Now, every time I mention the word of God, one of the things that you can remember is blueprint. What's blueprint? Okay, but we'll look up more into that a little later. So Colossians chapter 1, verse 18 and 24, it says, He is the head of the body. Who is the He? Jesus. Right? Jesus Christ is the head of the body, the church. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He may have the preeminence. Verse 24 it says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. 
Okay, so there it is, conclusive proof that uh, you know the church is the body of Christ. So the church is the body of Christ, and in that body, Jesus is the head. Okay, so Jesus is the head, and uh, the church is the body of Christ. Ephesians 1, 20 to 23, it says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is the, his body. Okay, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Okay, um, so in a sense, spiritually, every believer is joined to the Lord. I, I, once again, if you can look at First Corinthians six seventeen, it just kind of emphasizes that meaning. Okay, so um, he's the head. We are the body. The church is his body. So, uh, in other words, like Matthew ten forty, it says, "When someone receives us, they receive Jesus. When someone rejects uh, us, they reject Jesus." Okay. When uh, Paul, who was also known as Saul, when he was persecuting the church, what did Jesus say? Why are you persecuting me? Right. So he he took it very personally, isn't it? In a sense. Um, so. We see that Jesus is the head, church is the body of Christ, and he is the head of the church. And now because Jesus is the head of the church, and because Jesus is eternal, that means the church is also eternal. It's not like, okay, it's not only the body, you know, the head is alive, he's looking here and there, and this, you know, what I'm saying, right? Okay. Um, because the church is eternal and Christ, uh, and Jesus is eternal. The church is also eternal. Okay. Uh, all right. You know what? Let's pause here. I'll stop here. Uh, we'll come back after a 10-minute break and we'll resume. Okay. Thanks, guys.